In this series so far, we've looked at the legal history and conceptual challenges of privacy, as well as some of the more contemporary information security risks associated with digitalization and the internet. So we've talked about things like royal etchings and paparazzi, revenge porn and deepfakes, and various forms of organized digital crime ranging from individual identity theft to massive data breaches and cyber espionage. And through all this we've seen just how important privacy can be. That is, having your privacy violated can be absolutely devastating for a person's life. Now, as you may recall, in the previous video I promised that understanding these threats which arise whenever personal information is at risk of falling into the wrong hands, this is just the starting point. Once we've understood the threats, then the obvious next step is to figure out how to mitigate and safeguard against them, which is exactly what we'll focus on today. More specifically, this means we're going to look at some of the legal, organizational, and technical tools that all intersect, in various interesting and challenging ways, to provide us all with some introductory understanding of practical privacy protections. Ok, let's get started. Now, talking about legal, organizational, and technical tools for protecting the security of personal information might sound like quite a dry topic. And I won't lie, it's maybe not quite as much fun as, oh, watching dogs skateboarding on YouTube. But that's ok, because most things in the world aren't as much fun as that. But to try to still keep things interesting, don't worry, I'll make sure to use lots of concrete examples and really do my level best to organize this video in a way that makes intuitive sense so you can get as much out of it as possible. So for starters, let's revisit the way we organized the material in the previous video. If you recall, there I talked about the security threats to personal information that occur at the level of individuals, organizations, and societies. And since we've already talked about the threats in this way, it makes sense to also use the same way to talk about the potential solutions. Only this time we're going to reverse the order of things and begin at the societal level. Now, in our first video we looked at the legal development of privacy protections over time, so we already have some understanding of the general direction and thrust of things, and without going into too much detail we can confidently state that while there may have been big concerns in the 20th century about things like important life decision privacy, the 21st century has instead been characterized by an almost exclusive focus on the impact of digitalization on privacy. So, to rewind just a little to provide some historical background, the 1990s saw the launch and mainstream popularity of several new and exciting things, like grunge music and baggy jeans and brick-sized mobile phones, and more important in this particular context the wildfire spread of the global internet, which was possible only because so many families by then already had personal computers in their own homes. And with worldwide web connectivity came brand new means of spying and keeping tabs on people. The fact that so many of us so willingly gave away personal information, both knowingly at first, but then as time went on without realizing the full extent of everything that could be inferred about us, well, this all led to a new flourishing research interest in the impact of digital technology on privacy, starting with something like Helen Nissenbaum's work on contextual integrity. And this work has more or less continued to this day following one internet and social media and smartphone scandal after another breaches, vulnerabilities, insecurities, and so on, followed by increasing concerns about the manipulative and addictive nature of social media, which we'll look at in more detail in the next video. Either way, though, the increasing trade in personal information, its widespread collection, storage, use, and in some cases abuse, led to a big need to update existing legislation. Both for governments to ensure that terrorists and criminals weren't catching them unaware by exploiting the digital platforms to make society less safe. And then, at the same time, there were increasing general concerns about the amount of information that different organizations were holding about everybody. This came in particular after two important developments. The first was Edward Snowden's revelations about the National Security Agency, or NSA, essentially spying on all American citizens as well as many non-Americans around the world, in all their online dealings. And the second was Cambridge Analytica and their use of a rich and detailed Facebook user profiles to, among other things, psychologically target large sections of the American population in an attempt to sway their voting behavior, not least in the 2016 presidential election between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And although it was a bit slow to get started, nowhere has the legal impact of these developments been more wide-ranging and robust than in the EU, with its development of the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, so let's say a few words about that. The GDPR, which came into force in May 2018, is an EU regulation designed to protect the personal information, or as the GDPR calls it, the personal data, of EU residents. With its broad scope, strict requirements, and sizable fines, it's grown to become one of the absolutely most influential privacy laws in the world today. It applies to any organization, whether they're based in the EU or not, if they're processing the data of people in the EU. 
In practice, for reasons I'll get into in a moment, this has made it a kind of global baseline for the regulation of all personal information. Now, at its heart, the GDPR is built on seven key principles. In a nutshell, these are as follows. One, all processing of personal information must be done lawfully, fairly, and in a transparent manner for the people whose data is being processed. In practice, this means that the data processing needs to happen in accordance with one of the GDPR's stated lawful purposes, which includes things like that the people whose data is being processed have given their informed consent, or that the data is being processed to perform a task in the public interest or in official authority. This is uh, essentially why every website started popping up windows a few years ago, asking you to explicitly consent to their processing of your data. Two. Any collection of personal information can only happen for specified, explicit, and legitimate purposes and not further processed in a manner that is incompatible with those purposes. In other words, this so-called purpose limitation means that companies can't collect your data for one purpose and then decide that they're going to sell it on to another company without your prior and explicit informed consent, or whatever. Three. The principle of data minimization entails that any and all collected personal data must be adequate, relevant, and limited to what is necessary in relation to the purposes for which they are processed. This is a way of trying to get organizations to stop collecting vast amounts of personal information without any specific purpose in mind, not least given the sorts of breaches we've witnessed over time, like we discussed in the previous video. I'll get back to data minimization in a moment, as it's a very important concept in this entire discussion, although it's not really one that organizations have been particularly good at adopting in spirit so far, even if they do it in a way that looks like it's reasonably in line with the requirements of the GDPR. Four. All collected personal information must be kept both accurate and up-to-date, and if they're inaccurate for any reason, they should be erased or rectified without delay. This is an important element of personal information privacy, as it relates to the integrity part of the CIA triad that we discussed in the previous video. That is, that decisions about things like your credit score and therefore your access to bank credit should not be ruined by the banks and credit rating agencies having out-of-date or generally false information about you. 5. Much like the third principle about data minimization, the fifth principle about storage limitation sets out an important requirement that organizations and companies would do well to adopt more in the true spirit of its intentions, instead of just in terms of its minimal legal formulations. Again, I'll get back to this in a moment, but the idea is easy enough to understand. Collected personal information should not be kept any longer than it's absolutely necessary for, after which it should be deleted or purged or at the very least anonymized so that it can no longer be tied to any individual and therefore no longer counts as personal information. Uh, six. The data must be processed in a way that's reasonably secure, for instance, to avoid the sorts of major breaches we talked about in the previous video, but also to ensure that there's no accidental loss, destruction, or damage of the data. This covers using appropriate technical or organizational measures, so different cybersecurity solutions like encryption. This becomes particularly relevant at the level of organizations in relation to international standards such as the 27701, which I'll be discussing soon. Seven. Finally, organizations need to demonstrate that they have undertaken reasonable compliance with all the preceding six principles. That is, the organization is itself responsible for proving to the EU that it's done everything the GDPR requires it to do. Now, as you might have already noticed, what the GDPR really emphasizes more than anything is the rights of individuals over their own information through strict requirements on how different organizations are allowed to collect and process it. This rights-based approach is notably different from the other approaches we encounter in other countries around the world. The legal scholar Anu Bradford contrasted in particular with the American market-driven approach and the Chinese state-driven approach. Now, there has been a lot of talk about technological innovation recently, with various commentators claiming that the EU is increasingly lagging behind the USA and China. But Bradford points out that, regardless what may be going on on the tech innovation side of things, the very real bite of the GDPR has instead largely established the European rights-driven approach as a de facto global standard. Instead of developing a number of different regional variants of their respective services, big tech companies like Alphabet and Meta simply adjust their services everywhere around the world so that they're all in line with what the GDPR requires of them. This means that, although legally the GDPR only applies to the processing of personal information about people in the EU, in practice it has come to apply to a large extent to everybody in the world. 
Part of the reason for this is specifically the bite of the GDPR. And make no mistake, it bites hard. So, for instance, in 2023, the EU fined Meta 1.2 billion euros for the way it transferred EU residents' data to servers in the US, thereby making it susceptible to, among other things, spying on by the NSA. And it doesn't end there. Over the years, since its implementation in 2018, the GDPR has resulted in numerous fines of hundreds of millions of euros for big tech companies like Google, Amazon, and Meta. This is a very notable legal development, as there was earlier criticism before the GDPR that different legal fines for privacy breaches were little more than a slap on the wrist for the wealthiest multinational big tech companies, meaning they could effectively ignore them and just keep processing personal information however they saw fit. But the GDPR stipulates that it can levy fines of either up to 10 million euros or 2% of the total worldwide annual turnover of the preceding financial year, whichever is higher. And it can even double this in particularly egregious cases. Now, as I mentioned in the previous video, fines don't really seem to be an effective way to combat data breaches. But for now, that issue is beside the point. The most important thing at this stage is that the fines levied by the EU are big enough that they can have a significant impact on the stock price of the global big tech companies, which means that they definitely pay attention. I mean, the companies try to appeal the court decisions and undermine the law in various ways with European lobbying groups and other attempts to exert political influence. And some people have raised concerns that the second Trump presidency may result in the US levying more or less arbitrary fines against European organizations in a tit for tat manner to rein in this particular application of the GDPR to American companies. But regardless if things turn out that way or not, the result right now is that the GDPR has had a major impact on digital technology and the processing of personal information in a manner that really ripples out to every corner of the globe. And even apart from its fine-based bite, the general approach to the collection and processing of personal information covered by the GDPR has also inspired legal development in various other non-EU jurisdictions, such as Utah and Connecticut in the US, Quebec in Canada, Brazil, Japan, parts of Chinese legislation, and so on. Essentially, regardless whether we think Europe is slipping behind in terms of tech innovation or not, in terms of innovation in the legal space, the EU is right now far ahead of everybody else, even though large parts of the rest of the world are doing their best to catch up. Now, moving on to the level of organizations. Because of the global bite of the GDPR, it's very good to be familiar with its practical implications, regardless where in the world an organization might be located. In fact, for anybody watching this who is likely to either be now working or planning in the future to work within any relevant part of the tech sector, an obvious follow-up question is how to ensure that your organization is following the rules of the GDPR. There are many ways of ensuring this, but one of the most important and widely adopted options is to implement the international standard ISO 27701. This is a set of requirements and guidelines on security techniques and privacy information management, and an extension to ISO 27001 and ISO 27002, which are on information and cybersecurity more generally. So, while the GDPR is a legally binding regulation for any company that processes the personal information of EU residents, ISO 27701 puts this into concrete practice by offering a detailed framework for managing privacy risks. So, like many other international standards, it's a sort of set of steps that organizations can voluntarily undertake, and perhaps more importantly, where they can apply for certification. That is, proof that they follow the requirements of the standard in question, which, once demonstrated, means they can show to the world that they've received the qualification in question. That is, that they are ISO 27701 certified. Now, what ISO 27701 does in particular is ensure that an organization establishes a Privacy Information Management System, or PIMS. A PIMS integrates various privacy controls into an organization's existing security management practices. More specifically, it provides a systematic approach to a number of privacy-related concerns, including internal and external audits to identify different privacy risks and vulnerabilities within the organization, implementing various controls such as encryption, access management, and employee training, and demonstrating compliance with privacy regulations such as the GDPR. Although the standard is flexible in that it can also be applied in non-GDPR jurisdictions and cases. To dig into the practicalities a little more, a PIMS requires an organization to assess and manage the full life cycle of personal information. This begins with identifying which personal information is being collected, as well as how it's being stored, processed, and shared, and ends with ensuring proper removal of the data when it's no longer needed or if a person's consent is withdrawn.
The first step in implementing a PIMS is conducting a thorough data inventory, so essentially mapping out all the personal information within an organization's systems, as well as how it moves around within those systems. This basically means understanding where the information comes from, where it's stored, how it's accessed, and who has access to it. Once this mapping is done, the organization needs to implement various policies and procedures to safeguard the privacy of individuals' information at every stage. This includes ensuring that the information is stored securely, typically using encryption or other protection methods, and that only authorized personnel have access to sensitive information. This can be achieved by implementing strong access control policies, which are also a critical component of ISO 27701. For instance, limiting data access based on job roles and ensuring that employees are only able to access the information they need in order to perform their tasks can significantly reduce the risk of privacy violations. Another crucial part of a PIMS is employee awareness and training. Remember cognitive bandwidth limitations? Well, since human error is very often a significant factor in all sorts of data breaches and privacy incidents, then educating staff about privacy policies, data handling best practices, and the importance of confidentiality really is an essential step. Regular training programs like this make sure that employees stay updated on the latest privacy practices, risks, and regulations, and thereby ideally reduce the likelihood of accidental human error-based breaches. In addition, these training sessions can also emphasize the importance of data minimization, that is, collecting only the data necessary for specific purposes. As I already noted, this not only aligns with the GDPR's principles, but also enhances an organization's overall privacy posture. Okay. Let's just take a very brief moment to discuss data minimization before getting back to the bread and butter of ISO 27701. You see, data minimization is formally required both by the GDPR and the ISO 27701, but unfortunately, it tends to be one of those legal terms that's flexible enough to mean all sorts of different things. After all, if you're a big tech company looking to dominate the infosphere, you might reasonably claim to have a legitimate interest in all sorts of highly sensitive provided or inferred personal information about, well, essentially everybody. But then, requiring a company like this to minimize the personal information it collects becomes a bit of a moot point. Since they can claim a legitimate interest in all sorts of information, their data minimization is already, so to say, completed, legally speaking. So if we really want data minimization to have some proper bite, like some of the other parts of the GDPR, we might need to develop clear guidelines on what counts as essential personal information for different information processing contexts. But the companies are obviously going to resist any such development. They have a vested commercial interest in using everybody's information to develop new lucrative business models, so any restrictions in their access and use of personal information is likely to be resisted every step of the way. In other words, although everybody pays lip service to the legal concept of data minimization, there's a lot of room for tangible improvement here. Anyway, back to ISO 27701. Once an organization is done with its data mapping, its security policies and procedures, and its employee awareness and training, then the next step is to implement some monitoring and auditing mechanisms. Internal audits and assessments help identify potential vulnerabilities and gaps in compliance with both GDPR and the standard itself before they turn into bigger issues. For example, reviewing policies on data retention and ensuring they comply with the GDPR's storage limitation principle, so not keeping personal information any longer than absolutely necessary, can prevent an organization from retaining data beyond its usefulness and increase transparency in its data management practices. On top of these sorts of internal audits, external audits can verify compliance with privacy regulations and thereby strengthen the organization's credibility, demonstrating that it takes its privacy obligations seriously, which is obviously good PR for any company entrusted with people's personal information. In fact, this last point is one of the key benefits with ISO 27701 certification. I mean, on the one hand, certification means your organization knows that it complies with the GDPR or whatever other privacy legislation is in place in the country or countries that the organization operates within. So by aligning its privacy management practices with ISO 27701, the organization reduces the risk of non-compliance across legal environments. But then, on the other hand, becoming ISO 27701 certified also means a big marketing win, a potential competitive edge in the marketplace when compared with other companies. Since people worry more about their personal information and privacy nowadays than they did some 10 to 20 years ago, we're all on average becoming a bit more selective about which companies we trust with our personal data. A certification that proves an organization is following best practices for privacy management 
not only provides reassurance to customers, but also strengthens an organization's reputation as a trustworthy entity in the marketplace, which ain't a bad thing. Actually, just a quick side note, for any company or organization representatives watching this right now, here's a robust and very practical recommendation to really improve your competitive marketing edge. And on top of that, it's also in line with both the GDPR and ISO 27701, so win-win for both reputation and compliance. And, well, basically, the idea is just to take the GDPR's storage limitation requirement bloody serious in concrete practice. You see, privacy in the not-too-distant past was to some extent maintained by the fact that personal information decayed. People forgot what you might have said or done. Records that existed only on paper or papyrus or clay tablets were prone to being lost or destroyed, and there was no capacity to keep track of every little thing you said or did in the first place. So, a company that today wants to take privacy and information security seriously really should implement personal information decay as well. That is, to set up their personal information storage in such a manner that the information is automatically and irreversibly removed, cleared, expunged after a given amount of time has passed. As I'm sure you can appreciate, a data breach of 500 million users, but where basically all the personal information has already been purged, is not a particularly lucrative data breach for digital criminals, and so would make the entire digital ecosystem a far more secure space. Unfortunately, however, as I'm sure you can also appreciate, getting today's multinational big tech companies to implement this sort of personal information decay, and thereby to at least partially undermine their very business models of mining personal information for lucrative revenue streams, is extremely unlikely. I mean, it can happen, but probably best not to count on it anytime soon. Anyway, back to regulatory standards. One really important idea, and one that is foundational for both the GDPR and ISO 27701, is the notion of privacy by design. Basically, this refers to a proactive decision to integrate privacy and data protection measures into the design and operation of systems, processes, and products right from the very beginning. Rather than treating privacy as something that can be addressed later, Privacy by design emphasizes the importance of considering privacy risks and impacts during the planning and development stages of a project. This means that organizations need to anticipate and mitigate privacy risks before they even arise, which can significantly reduce the likelihood of privacy violations or breaches. One of the main objectives of privacy by design is to ensure that personal information is collected and processed in the least invasive way possible. For example, when developing a new system or service that involves the collection of personal information, the organization must carefully evaluate which pieces of information are actually necessary for the intended purpose so as to avoid excessive data collection. This is actually in line with the GDPR's principle of data minimization and so should be welcomed. Another important part of privacy by design is ensuring that personal information is securely processed and stored and that only authorized users have access to it. So again, things like encryption and access control mechanisms and so on, just like in the GDPR. In fact, the GDPR is in part inspired by specifically privacy by design principles, hence the overlap between the two. Now, that may all sound well and good, but the reality is that while privacy by design certainly emphasizes privacy in a way we might all want to see when it comes to the processing of our own personal information, it can be tricky to make sense of what it really entails. So, as a result, privacy by design has been criticized both for being too demanding in terms of the sorts of technical requirements it makes of companies and organizations, in particular if they're relatively small and don't have the resources to implement its various quite extensive requirements and recommendations in full. But even where there is no lack of such resources, it has also received critique for being vague. That is, that it's a bit unclear exactly what its principles demand in concrete practice. That being said, however, it should by now, to those of you watching this, be quite obvious that given the various problems companies and organizations have had successfully protecting the privacy of personal information, then whether there may be some vagueness problems with privacy by design or not, adopting as much of it as possible within a company or organization will, regardless of any residual vagueness, probably be better for us all. Now, privacy by design consists of various different principles, such as advocating being proactive instead of reactive, and preventive rather than remedial. But one of the most important principles, which is again part of the GDPR, is the principle of privacy by default. So this principle states, as the name implies, that for whatever processing of personal information is going on, the privacy setting should be on by default, 
That is, if the individual whose personal information is being collected and stored and used for whatever purpose does nothing, their interaction with the system should not trigger any infringement of their privacy. This is an important principle as it shifts the burden away from individual users who might otherwise overlook complex settings. But unfortunately, like many of the other things we've discussed today, its successful implementation is quite open to interpretation. So for example, if you open some new social media account and by default everything you post gets put on the public internet for anybody to see, then although the company could claim that it's respecting privacy by default, insofar as you posting on its social media can be assumed to imply your desire for the world to know whatever it is you have in mind, you might reasonably think that's a more perverse interpretation and that you actually had no such desire in the first place. And to be honest, the company might get away with their interpretation, in particular as you accepted the terms and conditions before you joined, which means you legally gave your GDPR approved informed consent to their particular interpretation. Now I'll have more to say about terms and conditions in the next video, but for now the important point is, even though strong and robust privacy protecting rules do exist and generally help push things in the right direction, you shouldn't think they magically solve all the various privacy problems we've been discussing in this video series so far. In fact, if anything, the number and size of breaches we discussed in the previous video is already a good indication that there's a lot left to do. That is, we're nowhere near solving the world's privacy problems just yet, regardless what regulations and standards we may adopt. So until the companies and organizations of the world manage to figure out how to make this all work to keep all of us individuals safe, unfortunately you're going to have to look after yourself. So let's say a bit about the individual level, what you can do today for yourself as a not too difficult way of trying to keep your own personal information out of the hands of digital criminals. And let's start that by illustrating with an example, Molka. What is Molka? Well, it's Korean and translates to something like hidden or sneaky camera. Basically, it's when small cameras are hidden and used to secretly record individuals, mostly women, in various private or vulnerable moments like in the bathroom or bedroom. So these are cameras that are so small that they can fit into everyday objects like clothes hooks or bathroom lamps or the corner of a picture frame or whatever. In this way, they can be strategically hidden in places like public restrooms, changing rooms, public transit, hotels, and so on, with the express purpose of recording videos that can then be shared or sold online in a digital black market of non-consensual candid footage. Now, Molka crimes began getting widespread attention in South Korea in the early 2010s as mini cameras became cheaper and far more widely available. Initially, the crimes were dismissed as isolated incidents by a few bad apples. In 2010, about 1,000 cases were reported. By 2021, that number had grown to around 17,000. And that's just what's been officially reported. In fact, the vast majority of victims never file any charges in the first place, either for fear of the social stigma of having their private moments revealed, or because they doubt the South Korean legal system's capacity to ensure any reasonable justice, or both. And the impact is severe. Let's start small, or at least what might seem small in comparison. So for many people, for many women, just knowing that these devices could be anywhere creates a constant state of suspicion and vigilance. In fact, women in South Korea have reported compulsively checking bathrooms or hotel rooms for hidden lenses, with some even carrying anti molka kits with various tools to block or destroy the cameras. But of course, the effects often go far beyond just unease. Victims who discover they've been recorded face emotional devastation. The footage is frequently uploaded to websites where strangers dissect their appearances in dehumanizing ways. Victims have described feelings of deep humiliation, isolation, and helplessness. And for some, the trauma proves too much to bear. There are harrowing accounts of victims who have taken their own lives after discovering they were filmed without their consent. So why hasn't this been stopped? A few reasons. For one, while South Korean law does criminalize illegal filming, enforcement has been weak. Convictions are rare, and even when they occur, sentences are often light, with fines or minimal jail time. In fact, less than 2% of cases result in significant penalties. Why? Because proving these crimes is exceptionally difficult. Victims are often asked to provide evidence themselves, forcing them to revisit their exploitation, and perpetrators can hide behind the anonymity of the internet. But this isn't just a legal failure, it's also embedded in some of the aspects of the local culture. In fact, the Molka epidemic has ignited quite a fiery debate about gender norms and misogyny in South Korea, with activists pointing to deeply entrenched attitudes that objectify women, enabling a culture where such violations are tolerated, if not normalized. In fact, in 2018, a female Molka perpetrator was given an unusually harsh sentence for illicitly filming a nude male model. 
when contrasted against the fact that 98% of Molka perpetrators are actually males and that most of them never face any punishment whatsoever, well, the dam just sort of broke. Some 70,000 women took to the streets in protest, demanding reform with a simple message, my life is not your porn. All right, this might all sound a little dramatic, but it highlights how collective action can occasionally force authorities and policymakers to take notice. But for those of us who putter around the internet without worrying on a daily basis that some creep is trying to record illicit spy cam video footage of us or steal our credit card details or whatever, street protests are probably a step beyond what most people would consider doing in order to better protect the privacy of their own personal information. So if not chanting in the streets, what should you do instead? Well, here follows a grab bag of the sorts of recommendations you can get from any number of different sources, which all say more or less the same thing. First, keep all your software on all your devices up to date. By far, one of the best ways of avoiding unnecessary risks to your personal information is to update and patch your operating systems and apps and so on as soon as any updates are available. This is really a baseline that everybody should apply. Second, use two-factor authentication on any account where it's available. Typically, this means verifying on your phone after logging in with a password, but there are other variants as well. It's available with many different services, but it should perhaps be more of a default option than it currently is. It's not foolproof, as illustrated by the phone snatching example I began the previous video with, but on average it makes it that much more difficult to gain illicit access to somebody else's account. Third, use a password manager, which will both help you generate unique passwords for every site and app and so on that you use, and also store them all in one convenient place, because you really should have a separate password for each and every account. Now, obviously there are security risks here. If a digital criminal gets access to your password manager, they'll have access to all your passwords. So the entryway must be securely locked down, ideally with a strong password and two-factor authentication. Now, there are several well-established commercial standalone password managers, but you can also use the one that comes built into your browser, if you prefer. Fourth, consider additional security on your devices, like encrypting and backing up all your personal photos and documents and so on. And, while you're at it, opt for some privacy-protective apps and websites. Don't Google or Bing, instead use DuckDuckGo. And consider switching to Firefox as your browser and cranking up the privacy settings to prohibit all sorts of tracking. Then lock down your social media accounts to share less by default, unless you're 100% certain you want everything you post to essentially be on the public internet for all eternity. In fact, lock down every account you have in this manner, social media and otherwise, to not send you update emails or messages unless you genuinely want them, to not deliver personalized ads unless you truly desire them, and so on. And if you have too many accounts and it's too much of a hassle to get through them all, well, that's a good indication that you should cancel many of them outright. Don't leave old unused accounts lying around the internet. And don't sign up for new ones unless they're genuinely interesting and useful to you. In fact, doing a bit of personal data mapping, keeping track of all the many accounts you have across the internet, is a great project for a rainy Sunday afternoon. Fifth, keep your email more secret than it already is. So every time you have to provide an email address in order to test out a new service or similar, use a fake 10 minute email or similar. Just search for it on DuckDuckGo and you'll find several options. And if you need a more robust and stable email that doesn't link directly to you, consider a paid for service like Firefox Relay, which gives you random fake emails that forward to your true email, but where the companies you're signing up for have no idea what your true email is. Besides, that way you'll also know who sold on your email to spam mail should it happen, depending on which fake email address the spam mailers use. I could go on. Get credit and identity protection. Use temporary generated bank card numbers if your bank offers them. Use the Onion Router or Tor network. Use a reputable VPN. Push for more widespread availability of encrypted client hello, and so on. But if I went through every option like this in detail, we'd be here for hours. So for now, the more important take-home message is just this. Yes, every little extra bit of practical privacy protective measure takes a bit of time and effort. And unfortunately, we live in a world where privacy is not convenient because of the simple fact that privacy is usually never the meaningfully default option. That is, no matter how good Facebook or Google or Microsoft may be with the cybersecurity side of things, they still suffer occasional massive data breaches. And unfortunately, the best thing you can do as an individual is to just try to ensure that you are not as low-hanging a fruit for the digital criminals as other people are. So with just a bit of inconvenient effort, you'll likely already be far ahead of most others, which will reduce the risks to your personal information correspondingly.
Now there is one last concern to raise in all this, and that is the following. In both the previous and this video, I've been talking about information security as all about making sure personal information doesn't fall into the hands of digital criminals, but what if our main privacy worry is less with identity theft and more with what the big tech companies are doing with our data completely legally? In fact, what if your concern is less with having your credit card details sold on the dark web and more with what Facebook and Google and the rest are actually using your data for? Because the truth is, even if they're doing it in a way that is mostly legal, apart from a few massive GDPR fines, well, that doesn't mean that a lot of us don't feel quite icky about what they do with all our information. After all, they seem to know an awful lot about us, and they also seem quite good at selling both products and ideas that might not always be in our own best interest. So what if our privacy concerns are less about information security and more about outright manipulation? Well, that, my friends, is what we'll discuss in the next video. I look forward to seeing you there.